this time on The Gadget Show. There's water, water everywhere, and no one escapes the soaking in our water gadget special. That is some nuts! Otis and I build a pair of high-tech, uber-cool watercraft, <laughs> then race them head-to-head. -head. No! In what has to be just about our most challenging build yet. Uh, also this time, I check out the very best waterproof jackets with the help of some potentially close friends. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely... Ugh. Delighted. I give you some vitally important advice on how to save your gadgets if you've given them a soaking. Excellent. And I get to play with some of the coolest radio-controlled boats you can buy. Look at it go, man! Welcome to a Gadget Show Wet n Wild special. Yes, this week is all about water-based tech, whether it's the stuff that keeps you nice and dry. Yeah, or the stuff where you just get completely soaking wet. All the stuff from which we're all made, guys. Huh? Yeah? You, Susie, are two-thirds water. A lot oh, of yeah? the viewers don't know that. In fact, if I was to wring you out, <laughs> you would fill a bath. And I'll be able to bathe in you. Oh, no, that's kind of weird. Beautiful. However... <laughs> he should stuck to the theme and he's kept his clothes on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, hold that thought. <sighs> yeah. In the meantime, there is a rather small matter of a very big challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A big challenge is going to see Otis and I building two incredibly sexy and high-tech pieces of kit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, this is a build challenge, so I'm thinking that already, yeah. Otis, it's going to favour Jason, isn't it? OK, fair enough. I, I respect your remark there. And, Jason, I uh, doff my hat to you. your proud history of gadget show builds. But it's a challenge I'm down for. Mm. All right, be careful. That's all I'm saying. Be wary, <laughs> okay? However, King, <laughs> yeah. crowns do slip sometimes. Oh, yeah. Our challenge began at a tranquil spot in Chippenham on the banks of the River Avon, where we'd been told to meet and await further instructions. I think I killed a small fish. Um, hang on, dude. Oh, Check that out. Look at that. Oh, yeah. dude. <laughs> that was awesome. Did you see that? All right, look. Jason and Otis, your challenge is to design and build your very own unique gadget boat. Build a boat? Have you ever built a boat? Have you ever been in a boat? I've maybe been near a boat. Yeah. OK, and in exactly one month's time, you must return to this very spot to race them head to head Whoa! in a special gadget show race. Good luck. Are you ready for a water fueled smackdown? Do you know what, Otis? I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> so the countdown was on. And pretty soon I had a brainwave. For this challenge, I really want to design something unique. A boat that has never been seen before. And the idea that has inspired me is this, the Inner Space Dolphin. Two years ago on a lake in California, I had the pleasure of testing this completely unique, fully submersible dolphin-shaped watercraft. That was your move! That's what I've been trying to do! Oh, yeah! Now, that went under the water. I don't need my design to do that. What I do need it to emulate is the slick design of this thing, the speed of it through the water, and the fun factor. Meanwhile, after a few hours of hardcore research, I'd come up with a unique idea of my own. I decided to go for solar power. Imagine, how cool will it be if I turn up on race day in a boat that harnesses the sun's rays? So we both had a sniff of a plan, but first we had to get some inspiration for our builds. I wasted no time in stripping to my swim shorts for a spot of water gadget fun. This is the Sea-Doo Sea Scooter GTI, and it's the preferred mode of underwater transport for scuba divers who like to glide over the coral. I'm hoping that this propulsion system might be just the job for my boat build. An electric motor spins a 10-inch diameter propeller at high speed allowing you to cut gracefully through the water. So, but my preference, really, is just gliding along like this on the top of the water. It just feels gorgeous. Having decided to go down the solar-powered route, I needed to see the theory in action. I'm in Hyde Park, slap-bang in the centre of my hometown, London, and you'll never guess what's over there. Come on. On the Serpentine Lake sits the Solar Shuttle, a 48-foot pollution-free catamaran that is powered by the sun's rays. Above my head is a beautiful mosaic pattern of 27 solar panels. They take the sun's radiation, convert it into electrical energy, which is stored in batteries that drive two silent motors beneath my feet. While Otis was on the water, I was still in it. 
but this time with a smaller, lighter and faster handheld propeller engine, the Bladefish 5000. It certainly feels quicker than the Sea Dew, but it hasn't got the same sense of buoyancy about it. So actually, traveling along the surface, half in, half out of the water, it's not as good as the Sea Dew. And that means it's probably not the technology I need for building my boat. And interestingly, Otis and I were soon sharing the same concern. How fast is this thing? Four and a half miles an hour. Three and a half miles an hour. But how am I going to be dealing in a race with three and a half miles, miles an hour? hour? What we'd seen so far just didn't cut it. If we were going to win a race, we needed speed. Speed of the butt-clenching variety. Speed to swallow your speedos. Now this is my cup of tea. This beauty is a sea bob, a gloriously designed seven horsepower electric personal watercraft. The engineering on this thing just screams quality and I can't wait to get it in the water. Unfortunately, I need some help. Boys, come on. <laughs> oh, let me at it. Oh, you're joking. Almost ripped off my baggies. Woo! Oh, yeah. Let's go, baby. The Seabob's amazing thrust and 13 miles per hour top speed is generated not by a propeller, but by an impeller, a clever engine that sucks water in, then forces it back out at high speed. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'd arranged to get my kicks on a Zego sports boat, a catamaran that shifts thanks to a 30 horsepower engine. This is exactly what the doctor ordered. It's got two polyethylene holes that just cut through the water. Yeah! It shows me that a catamaran is capable of speed. If I can try and incorporate this into my design, I'm on for a winner. Woo! Wow! <laughs> it's perfect! Holy trunks! That is the nuts! So we both knew what we wanted to do, but next up, we had to turn our dreams into proper, real gadget boats. So stick around to see who sinks and who swims as our boat building challenge continues shortly. Welcome back to our Gadget Show water special. We've taken the Gadget Show and simply added water to make it even more delicious. Right, I want to talk to you about waterproof jackets and staying dry because when you're stuck in the middle of a storm, what you really want is a top-notch waterproof jacket that keeps you dry. So I set about some testing and fortunately for me, I got to choose my help. Thanks! Yes, I'd chosen three strapping firefighters from Birmingham's Woodgate Fire Station to help me test my three waterproof jackets. All in the interest of science, you understand. I've got three of the latest waterproof jackets here and I want to test them to see how good they really are. And in the world of waterproof jackets, it appears that black is the new black. So I had a budget jacket, the Gellert Westcott, which is um, all black, a mid-range Berghaus Packlight shell, which is black with a logo, and a high-end Mammoth Choi Oi, which has sexy red zips, but is basically black. So, John, I'll we'll give you the Gellert, the Berghaus for you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Ryan, the Mammoth for you. Thank you. There you go. Cheers. Waterproof jackets need to be comfortable and allow plenty of room for movement while you're working. So my first test was to see how well they all performed when the boys rescued a damsel in distress, me, from a 13-storey building. Not a bad life, is it? First up was John in the budget Gellert jacket. Ready, John? Go! For the Lola! It's 100% polyester, so it's very lightweight. And the flexible fabric was soft to touch. Next up, I'd be rescued by Sam. He's the one in black with the logo. Although it's heavier than the Gellert, it still feels light due to the featherweight helium fabric. You happy with that? Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely ugh, delighted. Finally, it was the turn of Ryan. That's him with the red zips. The Mammoth has high reach sleeves to enable a good fit and dynamic movements. And from where I was looking, Ryan looked pretty dynamic. Thank you very much. So, after carrying me to safety three times, my firefighters had all found their jackets comfortable with plenty of freedom of movement. On to test two, breathability 
and time for me to see just how fit my firefighters really were. Three, two, one, go. When you're working up a sweat, it's important that perspiration from your skin can evaporate through the fabric of the jacket and keep you dry. Come on! Knees up! The membrane in the gelert releases water vapour from the body through tiny pores in the fabric, allowing the perspiration to evaporate into the air. Get going! I need sweat! The pores in the Berghaus fabric are 700 times bigger than a water vapour molecule, effectively allowing moisture to escape with ease. Arm up! Let me let out some of your sweat. And the underarm ventilation zips on the mammoth allow sweat to escape and aid further breathability. Right, it was time for a quick feel. I mean, feel how well the breathable jackets have performed. First up, the gallet. Arm up. Nice job. Oh, it's, it's bone dry. Right, let's have a look at this one, the Berghaus. So a little bit damp, that is. Does it feel like you're sort of trapped in a bit? I can feel a bit clammy, a bit? yeah. Ryan, yeah. stop running! Thank you. <laughs> Let's check the mammoth then. You can see that you've sweated a little bit there from your body. Let's just check in your arms. There's nothing. It's bone dry. So, at the end of the second test, the Gellert had kept John dry, but the Berghaus had failed to evaporate all of Sam's sweat, whereas Ryan had stayed pretty cool in his mammoth. So, on to our third and most important test to see just how waterproof they all are. Well, fellas, you're looking a little bit hot and bothered after all the exercise, but I've got just the thing for you. I was going to put them through a storm of a thousand litres of water a minute. They're all made of waterproof fabrics and have tapes covering their zips and stitching, but would they keep the boys dry? This is a great test for waterproofiness. Turn around. Oh, I'll put it on max, I think, don't oh you? Oh, oh, oh. Right, let's have a look. Right, let's see how waterproof these jackets are, everybody. Jacket's off. OK, we're going to start with the gellet. There's nothing. You are bone dry. There's a tiny, it's just one little drop there. Right, let's have a look at the Berghaus. What's, what's happened here? That has come through the zip, hasn't it? You can see the water here. Finally, let's have a look at the mammoth. Give us a spin, Ryan. Bone dry you are, aren't you? Yep. Absolutely bone dry. So the Gellert's water repellent finish and water resistant zips had kept most of the water out. The Berghaus's Gore-Tex membrane protection had failed to prevent Sam from a soaking, but the mammoth had completely fulfilled its claim to be 100% waterproof. And so, on to the G ratings. And it's two Gs for the Berghaus. Its featherweight fabric made for a comfortable fit, but it didn't totally evaporate Sam's sweat, and more importantly, it wasn't properly waterproof. It's three Gs for the Gellert, the lightest and blackest of our three. It provided excellent comfort, great breathability, and its water repellent finish only showed a small sign of leakage. But the winner with four Gs is the Mammoth. It was really comfortable and had the best breathability. And it stood up to the toughest soaking we could give it without letting in a drop of water. And here it is, the winning jacket. And what strikes me is how incredibly lightweight it, it is. It really is, but it performed beautifully in that test. Yeah, speaking of performed beautifully, uh, I can see why you were first to volunteer to do this product test. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, firefighters and everything. Yeah, yeah, you and a bunch of firefighters, great. What's wrong? A bit jealous? No. No, not at all. Yeah, you don't look like it all defensive with your arms, crap. Whatever! Actually, I've always thought that you'd probably make quite a good firefighter. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, thanks very much, Yeah, Sid. you can probably carry on with the show now, can't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> this week's top five, we're keeping it water-based, and we've sent Jason off to test out some of the best radio-controlled boats. And I tell you what, it's probably about the most fun you can have without stripping down to your speedos. Ah, uh -huh. well, it just so happens. I love my radio-controlled toys, and on The Gadget Show, I've had some great fun testing everything from amazing high-speed radio-controlled cars to cool radio-controlled flying gadgets. And now I'm going to get into some serious water-based action by testing 20 of the latest radio-controlled boats. <laughs> woo -hoo! Check him out! And I've got the lot from super-fast power boats... Look at this bad boy go! ..and electric tug-fishing boats to a one-metre-high fibreglass yacht. 
to test the electric boats, we'd focus upon speed by class and how easy they are to control. And I had radar control boat enthusiast Peter to help me with the testing. <laughs> So to test the speed of these boats, I've set up a 50 metre drag strip on water. The rules are quite simple. The first boat over the line wins that part of the test. And some boats clearly impressed, reaching speeds of up to 90 kilometres an hour. Though some, like the hobby engine Flash, failed to live up to their names. Total letdown, that is. The smaller boats were showing that size doesn't matter. Go on, little magic thing! Look at it go, man! It's pocket size and it's a rocket! The next test was to see how easy it was to navigate the remaining boats around a line of buoys. And it's not as easy as you think, especially controlling them at high speed. Ooh, that was 600 quid's worth of Thunder Tiger Outlaw. That's all right. A bit of water, look. At low speeds, the boats allowed more precise manoeuvring. And thanks to their low centre of gravity, they were easy to navigate. Well, after a lovely day here messing about on the water, I've come up with a definitive top five best radio controlled boats. And number five is the Seafire RTR Hydroplane Power Boat. Thanks to the brushless motor, which keeps the engine cool, allowing the boat to go faster, it zipped across the river, leaving other boats in its wake. And the two side projections on the hull give added protection and great stability on the surface of the water. And number four, it's the stylish Paradise Yacht. And I just loved it. The deep, weighted keel design and the lightweight fiberglass hull allowed relatively stable sailing, so I could control the sails and rudder with ease, whilst the five mile an hour wind did the rest. Look at that, man. By the power of the wind. It's brilliant. If you're after great control combined with performance, then at number three, it's the Warrior Offshore Light. Because it's so small and so fast, it, it kind of offers a really big fun factor. At 420 millimeters long, at a top speed of 23 kilometers an hour, the V-hull design cuts through the surface of the water with ease and provides great stability on tight turns. And number two, it's the awesome Traxxas Villain EX. The dual motors give great thrust and the counter-rotating surface-piercing propellers allow quick turns at speed. And thanks to the deep V hull design, it was stable and reliable. All the perfect ingredients for radio-controlled boating. That boat is incredible. Say hello to the number one in our top five best radio-controlled boats. The Magic V, this thing is incredible. It's an outright winner in so many ways. Despite its small size, just eight inches long, and weighing 125 grams, the Magic V was big on performance. And it's also great value for money, so you could even buy two and race them. This is awesome! <laughs> I love it! Oh, man, <laughs> that looked like real fun, dude. And it you was. know what? I'm really impressed that one of the more affordable models it's, made it to the top of your list. It's brilliant. We had boats there that were worth four or five hundred quid, you yeah. know, and were, were seriously well engineered inside. Yeah. And, and I can't tell how much pleasure it gave me to give this little cheeky chappy the number one slot. And it was so well deserved, it was in a class of its own. Welcome back to our Gadget Show Water Special. And next up, I've got some advice that could potentially save you quite a bit of money. I'm talking about how to save your gadgets if they get wet. Unless they're specifically designed to be waterproof, most gadgets stop working depressingly quickly after they've been dunked. But scan the web and you'll find a whole host of methods to dry them out, all claiming to work marvellously. But can you really salvage your tech after a watery encounter? And if so, which methods work the best? Well, to find out, I've been doing some thorough testing. You can almost guarantee that sometime in the life of your tech, it'll have a nasty encounter with water. And the top five causes of water damage are being dropped into the loo, rinsed in the washing machine, caught in the sink, tipped into the sea and dunked into a drink. But astonishingly, almost no phones are damaged due to synchronised swimming. Until now. I've given the swimming team four identical pay-as-you-go mobile phones, all fully working and all turned on. The underwater routine lasted five minutes, more than enough to give the phones a good soaking. Brilliant, ladies. I thought that was absolutely magnificent. A definite 10 out of 10 from me. And the phones are thoroughly soaked. Excellent.
I wanted to see if there was a watertight way of drying out a waterlogged phone. So I decided to try out four highly recommended methods of rescuing them. And all of them started off with exactly the same advice. Now, the first thing you need to do is take out the battery, pretty smartish, to cut off the power. You also might as well take out the SIM card and any SD cards you've got in there in an attempt to save your data as well. Right, it was time to put my methods to the test. Now, this tip might seem strange. It involves putting your waterlogged phone in the fridge. Cold air holds less moisture than warm air, so the chilled fridge air should draw out the tiny water droplets from the phone. However, if the phone gets too cold, it'll suck moisture out of the air when you take it out of the fridge, forming condensation inside the phone, making things worse. So the idea is you take the phone out every half an hour and leave it for ten minutes before putting it back. I kept this up for a full six hours and came back to see how it had fared. And... Oh, no! Nothing whatsoever. What a disappointment! Hopefully I'd have better luck with the next method. My next tip could be useful if you've dunked your phone at home and have some uncooked rice handy. Take the phone, including the battery, and put it in a container half full of rice. I use short grain rice as it's more absorbent than long grain. Then fill up the rest of the container and leave it for 12 hours. In theory, the dry rice will suck the moisture from the phone. I left the rice overnight to give it time to absorb the water. Would this technique work? And no signs of life at all. Just a squishing noise. This really wasn't going well. For the third method, I turned to suction power using a vacuum cleaner. I'm going to use the nozzle attachment in an attempt to suck the water out of the phone. Here we go. I kept this up for 20 minutes, vacuuming away at every bit of the phone's case in an effort to get all the water out. Aha, oh, we've got lights. Ooh, oh, something's happening. Oh, no, 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 no. I thought for a moment we'd had a success, but no! So I turned to a trusted old favourite. The table lamp method. Place the components under a lamp and leave for 12 hours. Make sure the bulb's about 50 centimetres from the phone so you don't melt it. All light bulbs generate heat as well as light, so this should be a good way of evaporating moisture from your handset gently. Like the rice method, I left it overnight and came back to check the next day. And nothing's happening at all. No lights, no sound, nothing. Another failure! And the table lamp method had worked for me in the past, but still nothing. Four phones, four methods, four disasters. Not very encouraging results if you've got a soaking phone. But in true gadget show style, I didn't let failure stop me. I collected four new phones and dunked them, but for only a minute this time. I ran the tests all over again. Would getting them out of the water more quickly help save my phones? First off, I tried the fridge method again. The blue panels come on, but that's about it. Another failure. Fridges don't seem to be the place for wet phones, so I moved on to the rice method. Aha. Just a blank screen. We have lights, there is someone at home, but they're not making any sense. Hello? Still no good. Could the vacuum cleaner do better? Hmm. Now, will it actually work? Ooh! Hello? Hello, 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 hello. I'm coming from all angles. Excellent. It worked. Finally, we had a success. The water had been completely sucked out. What about my favourite lamp method? Working is working is working. Brilliant. Fantastic. The heat had fully dried out the phone overnight. That's two out of four. So, there are ways of drying out your waterlogged phone, providing you get it out of the water as quickly as possible. Really cool test, John. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really glad you did that because so many people ask me on a regular basis, what shall I do with my phone? It's wet. Because people drop them down the loo, don't they? Yeah, I mean, we know Jason's done it on at least two occasions. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think whatever you've done with it, though, speed is definitely of the essence. You've got to get it out of the water and get that battery out as soon as possible. Mm. Yeah, good mm. point. And also, maybe don't put your phone in your back pocket. Mm. 
<laughs> For a step-by-step -step guide on how to save your gadgets from a watery grave, log on to our website at 5.tv forward slash gadget show. There you'll find handy written instructions on what to do when accidents happen. It includes all the drying methods we've covered here and a few other tips you may find useful. And we'd like to hear from you about your methods too. If you think you know the perfect way to bring drowned gadgets back to life, then get on the website and tell us now. Right, now it's time to return to this week's challenge between Jason and Otis. They were each given the task of building a gadget watercraft and then going head to head in a high powered boat race. Otis has gone for a rather cool sounding solar powered catamaran and Jason, well Jason's gone for some sort of body boat idea and he'll probably add in some kind of engine. Anyway, we rejoin the action as their ideas are about to turn into reality. If Otis and I were going to make anything as unique and fun as what we'd experienced during our research, <laughs> we were going to need some expert help. I've secured a meeting with Top Brass here at Norco, one of Britain's leading fiberglass moulding companies. Norco GRP craft components for some of the biggest names in the boat industry, including Sunseeker Yachts. And I met up with project manager Bob Tett to discuss my dream. Basically, what I'm trying to do is to turn me into a boat. Something completely unique and that carries me on the top of the water. Okay. Something that I think in my, in my sort of creative craziness is built around me, is quite small, OK? Yep. Possibly tailor-made that I jump in the water with and I shoot off and hopefully beat okay. Otis. To help with my solar-powered boat, I called in David Ackeroy, the engineering mastermind behind some of the Gadget Show's greatest ever builds. And, unbeknownst to Jason, we were well underway. I'd bagged myself a set of Zego catamaran hulls identical to the ones on the boat I tested. It's going to give us a great platform to put everything on we need. They're great. Brilliant, brilliant. And soon we'd drawn up a marvellous sketch of my solar-powered catamaran. An then steering mechanism here. We can do that. Brilliant. Meanwhile, back at Norco, Bob and I had finally settled on a plan. Perhaps similar to an H-shaped catamaran where you can lay through the middle. Yes! Of... OK. A catamaran. I'm loving it. Catamaran for a man. Man-cat! David and I had got our hands on two Sanyo solar panels. Dave, these are the panels, yeah? Covered in layers of crystalline silicon, they absorb the sunlight and an electrical current is produced. So all we needed now was an electric engine. David, I found a motor. If you have a look at this, a few weeks ago I suffered the humiliation of losing a boat race to Susie. Now, the motor she had was from a company called Torquedo, and it was one horsepower. I know for a fact that they have more powerful engines available, so I'm going to go to them. The idea for my Mancat's propulsion system also came from some past testing, as I showed Bob a video of the PowerSurf FX. Woo! A powered surfboard with an impeller engine that shifts at 25 miles an hour. So you reckon if I can get hold of one of these, that you can incorporate the engine into the Mancat? Yes, we could definitely put it into it. I love your confidence, Bobby boy. Meanwhile, my team was going great guns. We had bolted our two hulls together with aluminium struts. Cool. And paid a visit to the welders to knock up the boat's steel framework. Cool. OK, this cage here uh, will be where I will be. I'll be sat down like this. My solar panels will be on the side here, and they'll fly up like wings. Yep. By attaching motorised actuators to each of the panels, we'd engineered an awesome set of wings. Testing, sun clear. That move to soak up all the sun's rays. Genius, eh? Oh. Oh. <laughs> but it didn't stop there. The engine is here. Come on, Dave, let's go. Right. <laughs> Ooh, there that go. looks gorgeous. And it was the very best. Pure grunt. A top of the range 10 horsepower electric propeller motor. To provide the 48 volts for the motor, I've got two 24 volt batteries here, which will be wired up in series, yes. Now these will be charged using the solar panelling, but because I can't rely on the British weather, I'm going to have to leave these out to charge for at least a couple of days. Back at Norco, the man cat was beginning to take shape. We'd moulded our two catamaran hulls from toughened fibreglass. Look at this thing, it's beautiful, it's like a stealth bomber. Beautiful. Isn't it? And to give my boat a unique superhero type feel, we moulded a torso shaped base plate. This is so cool! Is it too late to ask for these to be a little bit bigger? And used it to seamlessly join up our holes. 
Then when the Power Surf FX finally arrived, oh look, Whoa, there's the engine. Wow. We took a great big hacksaw to it, isolating the impeller engine module at the back. Then we extracted the cables for the speed throttle and engine's directional rudder and ran them to the front of my man cat's hulls. In all your years, Bob, I bet you never thought you'd be building something like this. Never. It's a great project. Isn't it? So interesting. Brilliant. My crazy dream was quickly becoming a glorious reality. And having filled the holes with foam for added buoyancy and applied a final watertight layer of fiberglass, my beautiful creation was ready to receive a glossy black paint job the Batmobile would be proud of. Our two boats were finally finished. Our work was done. We could do no more. I reckon the man cat is ready to race. I'm ready for war. But the story doesn't end there. Well, not for me anyway, because on the day before the race, I received some disastrous news. Bob and his team had taken the man cat out for a test run. And incredibly, it had sucked up a stone. The engine's impeller was shattered beyond repair. I, I couldn't believe it. The race was just 24 hours away, and I had no boat. My hopes of competing, let alone winning, were in tatters. Tatters! Yeah! Oh, I mean, oh, oh no! no! We can't just leave it like that. I mean, you've blown your boat up. Uh, the stone happened? has wrecked me thingy, me impeller. So what happened next? I can't tell you that. No. You've got to wait like everyone else to see, to find out. Yes. No, I need to know now. No, no, you must wait like everybody else. Will Jason be able to rescue his contraption in time for the race? Or will I be racing alone in my solar-powered cage-fighting device? <laughs> it is a little bit like a cage-fighting like device. <laughs> yes, will I be able to get my fiberglass monstrosity back on the water? Stay tuned to find out. Yeah, but you can tell me in the break. No! Welcome back to The Gadget Show and the climax of this week's challenge. Yeah, well, at least it was meant to be a climax. Yeah, Jason and I each had to build the best gadget boat we could using the latest tech and then enter it into a gadget boat race. I had put together this, a catamaran with a difference, one that harnessed the power of Ra. Yeah, whereas I built something that was loosely based on my fantasies of building a comic book character boat, all right? I got a bat boat that looked dead cool, but also sucked a stone into its engine and stripped the whole thing out. So, Jason's boat was broke. Would he be able to fix his contraption in time to enter the race, or would I be going it alone in this bad boy and win without even getting my toes wet? After a month of research, meticulous planning and painstaking building work, Judgment Day had finally arrived for Jason and I. We were back in Chippenham on the River Avon where, in just three hours, we would be racing head-to-head -head in front of the crowds gathered for Chippenham's annual Dragon Boat Racing event. <laughs> While Otis had arrived fresh-faced and confident about the race, <laughs> my hopes were hanging by a thread. My team's day had unbelievably started at 4 a.m. when a replacement for the shattered engine impeller had arrived after an eight-hour, 1,000-mile journey from southern Spain. And ever since, Bob and I had been working like mad people to rebuild the man cat. Bob, we've got an hour to go. We're going to get there. You know, we'll give it our best shot. That's, that's all I can ask, man. That's all I can ask. Oblivious to my competitor's woes, I was about to take to the water for the first time. OK, so this is my steering. This here is my throttle. Enough with the preliminaries. Put me in the water. OK, so... It floated, which was a good start. But then when I slammed the throttle forward, I liked the speed. Look at the front coming up, eh? The speed, man! My solar-powered catamaran was alive. Ah, oh, this is cool. My man-cat, however, was far from alive. Bob had fitted the new impeller, but now we had to rebuild our engine before any testing could take place. A few more connections to make, get a battery on. I've got a piece down near the fit, but I think we can do it. OK, I'm going to get my wetsuit on. Is that OK? Yeah. Awesome. We'll be there. With Otis now off to the start line, Bob and I were out of time. We had to give my man cat a test run. Are you ready? Nearly there. 
good sign, isn't it? I'm laughing the sound of that. We done it. Oh yeah, baby. All the hard work had paid off. Oh! I was back in the race. <laughs> All right, Bob, I'll see you at the start line. Yeah, you owe me a drink. The crowds were now building as race time was just five minutes away. But weirdly, I was the only one there. No sign of the Bradbury. Could this mean I win by default without even starting my engine? <laughs> that would be nice. Oh, how wrong he was. Because with just a minute to spare, I arrived. Otis. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, what is that? Stealth, baby, that's what that is. It's like you had help with Batman. It is totally superhero, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not faster than mine, though. No? Well, that, we're going to find out, Yeah, dude. we are. So this was it. Game time. Four weeks of hard graft had come down to this one moment. Two men, two boats, and 300 metres of open water ahead. Go! Fighter. We both got off to a flyer. Come on, Tex, don't let me down. And at the 100 meter mark, we were amazingly still neck and neck. Come on! I had my throttle on full whack, and the torpedo engine's 12 inch propeller was whizzing round at over a thousand revs per minute. Come on! I was not going to give up, though. The Man Cat's new impeller was thankfully working like a dream. And somehow, with just 50 metres to go, I managed to edge a lead. Yes! Yes! No! Come on! It was a disastrous moment. As Jason pulled ahead, my boat became unstable in his wake. Oh, no! No! Come on! The finish line was now in sight. In my shorts! In my suit! <laughs> I kept my finger on the throttle and snatched victory by just five metres. <laughs> say congratulations to both of you because yeah. I think both of your boats were amazing. But the most impressive thing for me is that even though I used a mannequin to mould this section, it is actually exactly like my actual body. <laughs> yeah, but do your legs go all the way down to the bottom of the No, boat? my leg, I have one leg, it's very flat, like that. <laughs> <laughs> one very flat leg. Well, after his flat leg, that's all we've got time for on this week's show. We will see you next time. See ya! See, see you next time! Nice torso. Oh, thank you.